Thanks very much, Greg. And um, we're going to show a little video real quickly here to start. So a lot of the other talks I was watching, go ahead. Uh, a lot of the other talks have a lot of pictures. I don't have a lot of pictures. So I thought I'd show this video. There it is. So just hit the play on the bottom left, just like YouTube. So this is just a, a, a stream gauging site that USGS has, and they actually put a camera on it. And this is over the last, since January, since the beginning of the year. And you can see it's pretty cool. If you caught it there, there's a whole bunch of load moving through at that one moment. That's it. So we can go to the PowerPoint. Yeah. Raise this up. So thanks very much for um, inviting me here. Um, I am Paul Gledhill in Ohio EPA. Um, this talk is um, based on work that we've done for the last four years. It's uh, the title of the talk, Tracking Nutrients to Guide um, Management. It's our nutrient mass balance program that I'm going to talk about. Um, Josh Griffin, he's a, uh, my colleague. He's also a, a production farmer, young production farmer from Wyandotte County. This is kind of his project. He, um, he's been starting this from the beginning. He, uh, this is his talk. I've never given this talk before. I learned earlier that we're in a former bowling alley. So I've never given a talk in a bowling alley before. So this is a pretty big deal for me. And um, it, it's a neat um, project. Uh, hopefully you'll find the, the, the process that we use pretty straightforward. And um, we've been giving this talk for a while. And I'm going to show you where you can download this report. Um, so this is a statewide project. Uh, it kind of focuses on our large endpoints, which would be Lake Erie and the Ohio River. Um, we look at nutrients, um, the total phosphorus, total nitrogen. We really don't get into the species of nutrients we're talking about with nitrate, nitrite, or with DRP in this project. Okay, my first click, it worked. Um, so excuse me for the notes, I've never really given this talk. So uh, we use the results from this project to kind of help us guide, um, understand what the relative loads are from different big, large watersheds in Ohio. I'll show you those in a second. It also helps us break down what the sources of the phosphorus loads. So the, all the talks that have, I've listened to here after lunch have been great because we're seeing where's the nutrients coming from the edge of field and what's the situation. This is kind of looking at the, the big picture of uh, what are we seeing at the end of the watershed and doing our best to figure out where the, lo where the loads are coming from there. So in theory, at some point, we can bring our two research efforts together and, and kind of harmonize them um, and unify them. So, so as far as large load sources, uh, combined sewer overflows, non-point source, so ag, develop land, we kind of have them all grouped in this project, and then permitted wastewater. Uh, we also use this, um, this project to help us support the project areas that Ohio EPA and the other state agencies participate in a great deal, Lake Erie, agri um, nutrient reduction um, goals, the algae reduction goals. That's a huge one. Also, um, Ohio's active in the Gulf of Mexico, hypoxia, dead the, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. There's an international task force that deals with that. We also do this because we're required to. Um, state law was passed in 2015. It was part of the budget bill. And uh, Ohio EPA is under statutory requirement to calculate the total loads being delivered by every watershed and to uh, divide up the sources of the, their loads. And we're required to report on this every two years. So here's what the report looks like. This is our second version of the report. Um, you can download this right now on our website. The website, the, um, uh, the URL is listed there, but a really easy way to get this, if you can just remember to Google, just Google Ohio EPA Nutrient Mass Balance Study. It um, pops right up, and I'll mention that again at the end if, if you have interest in this and you'd like to look more at the project. So I mentioned in the beginning that we were looking at these large endpoints, and we, we often call these far field. So, so with this project, it, it, it's very helpful to understand the, the nutrients being delivered to Lake Erie, to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, these are generally fine. Most of these loads are delivered during the higher flows. So the non-point sources, they become kind of a bigger deal, right? They're driven by more precipitation. Um, Ohio EPA has a history of looking at near field at the streams, you know, like the Maumee River or North Turkey Foot Creek, the little tributaries. And, and what we found there is, so we're worried about the resource there, what's happening in the stream. Generally, we kind of are more worried about the lower flow period, maybe May through October. Um, when we look at near field issues, um, the, we, we're finding at least, we're still finding really that the, it's the point sources that kind of are a little more responsible for the impacts we see in the near field. Um, so here's where the study has been carried out for. There are nine watersheds. You can kind of see that, right? There's nine watersheds. Um, six of them are in Lake Erie. The, um, we go from the Maumee, Portage, Sandusky, Vermilion, and the Cuyahoga are included in this. In the Ohio River drainage area, we have the uh, Great Miami, the Scioto, and the Muskingum. So check out on the map, I'm going to use the laser pointer, these red dots. We're calling these, our, those are our pore points. So these are areas where we're actually making all of our calculations balanced to the, the nutrient, of the nutrient mass balance. 
Um, ex with the exception of the Scioto, most of these pore points are very close to the mouth, to the end of each watershed. Um, you, if anyone heard Laura Johnson's talk yesterday, these are actually sites that Laura Johnson, the Heidelberg University, is um, calculating or is measuring the, the uh, nutrients. Uh, i get a slide on that coming up. So we cover, uh, this covers 66% of the Ohio land area, and we're uh, working to extend that to, cover, to get some of that gray area. I'll mention that at the end of the talk. Uh, so we'll get into the methods a little bit. We do, we're calculating based on, um, we're, we're calculating the annual loads, and we're dividing up the sources by the annual, and we do that on the basis of water year. Water year has been mentioned a few times here, and water year is basically October 1st through September 30th. It's, it, it's a convention that hydrologists and folks that look at um, loading data have generally used. It's the way that we can talk with the folks that are fo um, doing the Annex 4 reductions, the, the Lake Erie um, algae reductions, and, and other F issues. That, that's the convention we follow. And so if it were 2016, October 1st, then that would be the beginning of the 2017 water year. Okay, so the whole nutrient mass balance is based on real data, on, on data that's collected at a very high resolution. Um, Laura, some of you, I am not sure if Laura presented this yesterday, but basically these are at USGS stream flow gauges where, they, where they're monitoring every 10, 15 minutes how much stream flow is moving across to a given point. And um, what Laura's group, and now USGS is doing a lot of this too, is they, they put in a second house or they can fit it in the original gauge house, and that house will have um, a basin where water is pumped up into, and then an auto sampler, a refrigerated auto sampler. So it looks something like this in cartoon form. And uh, this, this thing has several bottles, usually 24 bottles. And we, at a, the way um, Heidelberg does it is every um, three times a day, every eight hours, water is pumped. So fresh stream water is pumped into one of these containers. And so every day, um, Laura's group will run a sample. So they'll, they'll, at the end of the week, they'll collect these, and every day they'll run a sample. If there was a lot, of, lot happening, if the stream was moving up or down a great deal on a given day, they'll run all three samples from that day. So we, we were, she's collecting a great deal of information, and we're able to use that to calculate the load with a really high amount of certainty of what's going through um, that stream. So that's the pore points. And again, the pore points would be right here on this map. This is a schematic of, of our method of the process that I'm talking about today. So the pour, the pour points uh, is where it all hinges on. That's where we have our high degree of certainty of what the load, what, what actually the mass of phosphorus and nitrogen that's moving through is being delivered from that point. And it would be the total mass for the year in, this, in the case of this study. So on the schematic, we have these orange squares. They represent NPDS. That, that's our permit system that Ohio EPA regulates um, sources that discharge in the river. So that's your wastewater treatment plants, municipal wastewater treatment plants, um, any real industrial source that discharges water into the state. Um, we, we require them to have a permit. We also take in consideration HSTSs, that's home sewage treatment systems, it's your septic system. So that's where we have um, just the diff more diffuse but still a, a kind of a known amount of nutrients getting delivered. And then we also are looking at non-point source. Um, this study, so w that includes um, your agriculture runoff that we've been talking about in tile flow, uh, also urban storm water, um, all kinds of urban drainage. So the way we do this balance, these two equations on the bottom, we add up the permitted point sources, the, those wastewater treatment plants and the industrial sources, and then we add up the home sewage treatment. We add up how much load is being delivered from the home sewage treatment systems, um, your septic systems, and then the remaining load that we have left that is needed to equal what the total point, poor point was, so the, the, what's missing, we attribute that to the non-point source. Right. Well, you know, Ohio EPA is pretty good at making people get permits um, if you have a point source. Um, there are s smaller, smaller um, facilities uh, fall under a, a, a whole suite of general permits we have that are, are pretty, re pr very easy to uh, uh, go through the motions uh, and get in the paperwork on those. Um, the, I do have a slide coming up on our, our MPDS, our permitted sources, so we'll save kind of some more details on that. It's the ver uh, very next slide. Yeah. Right, that would be within the non-point source. So, yeah, it's all grouped in there, and, and we have a slide on that, and that will kind of hit on that too. So, so that's how we. So, the, like I said, at the end, ooh, at the end, what's left over is we we attribute to non-point source what we haven't added up. Um, but that just gets us to the poor point, 
And we really want to know the whole watershed. In the case of the Maumee, we have two very large wastewater treatment plants in Toledo that are downstream of the Waterville measurement plant. So we want to make sure we include those. The same in the Cuyahoga watershed, one of Cleveland's large uh, wastewater plants is downstream. So the way we um, calculate the downstream of the four point is we, again, we add up the point sources, the, the ones we have permits for and the, um, the home sewage treatment systems. And then we apply the same um, uh, unit area of um, non-point source. So whatever we calculated for the poor point as far as um, phosphorus, pounds of phosphorus per acre, we attribute that to all the acres downstream the poor point in this study. So I'm going to go into each of those sources real quickly here on the next few slides. Oh, I never saw that. Okay, so the non-point source uh, Greg was just asking about, um, municipal, the municipal sources, your, your public wastewater treatment plants in all of our cities and villages have them. Um, that's where we have the, the most data. That's where the most of our point source nutrients are coming from. They, they monitor, th those facilities, they monitor based on the permit we give them. They monitor those nutrients and they send us the data. Electronically, we can, at my, our desk, click and pull those up. It's a pretty high degree of data. For every facility that we consider a major, that, that is they discharge, they're designed to discharge one million gallons a day or more, they have to monitor um, nutrients uh, twice a week. And um, they don't vary that much at wastewater plants. So we, pretty high degree of certainty on these uh, data. Uh, so Greg, in here, in the, in, to answer kind of part of your question, in the industrials here, n not all industrial facilities are going to have phosphorus or nitrogen. A lot of them don't. I would say most of them don't. Um, so we do our best to, it, it, certainly uh, with our permitting unit, if, if they have phosphorus, if they have nitrogen, we want to at least have them re report that. They monitor that and report it to us. But we, we do get to a point where we say you're de minimis. You, you don't have enough phosphorus to really go, or nitrogen to go into our study. There's a lot of facilities that they're just a, a large factory, and they really, they don't have any discharge except they have storm water, and they still have to get a permit for their storm water. So the um, calculation for the home sewage treatment systems, the way we do that is we um, look at the population of, e of each watershed, and we use the census data. Census data uh, from the, the, the National Census Service, they, um, they have very high resolution data that we can get on GIS. So we break down how many people are in all of the unsewered areas. Uh, from research, we know how much nutrients the average um, home sewage treatment system delivers, and it, uh, how many nutrients and how much flow they deliver. And we adjust those, um, w those, what we've got from those calculations based on what we know of failure rates from study, um, kind of regionally, and that's studies um, that Ohio Department of Health has done. So the non-point source, yeah, so that's what we balance to, that's what everything ends up at. Um, the real important point, and I think that, um, is we don't differentiate between sources in this. We're not saying when we say in some watersheds it's 80% non-point source, we're not saying it's 80% ag or it's 80% developed. We're saying it's 80% non-point source. We, ha we can't differentiate that with this method. And, and to the other point, background would be included in this. Generally, background is considered pretty low. And in fact, I think in the Muskingum watershed, we, we probably can kind of maybe do some uh, interpretations of what the background might be. And I'll, I'll mention that here when we look at Muskingum. So um, while we can't differentiate based on our methods, where the non-point source is coming from, we do understand that there's very different land uses in the, in the watersheds. So here on this um, map, um, on this graph, uh, we're going, uh, the first six are Lake Erie draining watersheds. It goes from west to east, Maumee to Cuyahoga. And then the last three are the Ohio River draining the Great Miami to the Muskingum. This is percent of um, land use, uh, so all, they all go to 100. So you see in the western um, Lake Erie, all three of the major watersheds are basically um, at 80% ag land, land use. Um, another important thing to see here that will maybe can give us some ideas of what the data is telling us is the Cuyahoga. The Cuyahoga is 50% um, developed. That's the pink and the red, the high intensity and low intensity. I said that inversely. And then the Muskingum is also kind of interesting because it's 50% um, um, what, what we group here as natural land. It's mostly forested. So we think we see some things in the data from mus having the Muskingum in this. So now here's the, here's the actual data that we've crunched, um, just to give you an overview of what we're seeing here. Again, it's the same watersheds from uh, left to right, um, west to east of the first six are um, Lake Erie drainage, and the last three are the Ohio River. Um, the, this is total, this is, this is the average of the last five years we've calculated, 2013 through 2017 water years, and it's the total um, load of phosphorus, and it's in metric tons per annual, so it's the metric tons of, of the average of each year. Um, one metric ton of phosphorus, that's 2,204 pounds. Okay, so, so in the Maumee, which has our, our largest load, you know, so that's, that's two, uh, 
what is that, 2,200 2, metric tons, you know, multiply that by 2,020. So it, it's quite a, quite a bit of pounds, quite a many thousands of pounds. Um, the Mami and the Sayota, they have the largest loads. But you also notice on here next to each watershed name, we see that there's different watershed. Every watershed obviously drains a different amount of area. The Mami is, is very large. It, it drains um, over 6,500 square miles. So you would expect the Mami to be a great deal larger than the Portage. In a second, we'll look at kind of area yields. Um, but that said, the Muskingum is our largest watershed um, in our study. It's over 8,000 square miles, but it's, it only contributes to the fourth um, highest amount of load. So what we mentioned before with it having um, so much forest land, that, that probably does explain that. We expect forest land or background phosphorus to be a great deal lower than land that's used for urban developed areas or for agriculture. And um, that is the three things I wanted to say on that slide. So here's our yields. This is phosphorus yields. Um, we got two different colors on these things, which didn't come out great. But so the gray is our non-point source yield. So what we've done here is we've normalized um, each of these loads by the um, area. So so you, what the gray bars mean is they tell you how many pounds per area or per acre. Sorry, we we normalize this to pounds per acre. And then the blue bars that's normal. That's the um, NPDS and the HSTS. When the vast majority of the nutrients from our point sources like that, they're coming from people, right? They're, they're from us. And so we've normalized those by the population. So those blue bars, they, what they equal is pounds per person. That's how we've decided to do that. So we, we think we can learn some interesting, interest, interesting things for that, and, and we'll go through a couple watersheds looking at these. Um, when we're looking at all the watersheds together, the highest um, non-point source yields we see in the um, highly agriculture, uh, Lake Erie drainage, the, the, the Maumee, Portage, and Sandusky. Um, the per capita, the, the per capita, the, the, um, the phosphorus per person, you'll notice, oh, I went the wrong way. Uh oh, there we go. The uh, blue bars are way higher here in the uh, Ohio River drainage, and, and that's because there's no phosphorus limits at the wastewater plants in the Ohio River drainage. All of, all of our municipal wastewater plants that are over a million gallons a day that drain to Lake Erie, Ohio EPA has phosphorus limits on them. They have to meet, they have to reduce their phosphorus. So one, usually it's about one um, milligram per liter. There's no such thing in the Ohio River drainage, and we really see that. That really pops out in our three Ohio River drainage um, per capita yields. And... Oh, yeah. Another point we wanted to make was um, not only are there limits, uh, phosphorus limits at these wastewater plants in the Lake Erie drainage, they're doing way better. So most of the majors have a limit of one milligram per liter. That's their, a concentration limit. But they're actually all, uh, taken as a whole group. Their average is closer to 0.4. So they're, they're doing above and beyond with the um, wastewater treatment. Okay, so uh, total nitrogen, like I mentioned, is, is in this study. If you download it, you'll see everything I'm about to show you for phosphorus. You'll see also for total nitrogen. Really, the takeaway here is there's not so much of the differences between the non-point source and the point sources between the Ohio River and the uh, Western Lake Erie, like we saw with phosphorus. I'm going to look at a few watersheds in particular here. So I'll orient you to this really crazy, busy um, plot. This is the last five years of the Maumee that we've calculated. So each of these are Maumee water, are water years of the Maumee. Um, the the multicolor bars, that's the same thing we saw on average um, on the earlier plot. So that's the total load for each of those years. And then, it's divide, and then we separate it out by the source, non-point source in red. And then the um, greenish is our permitted um, point sources, um, NPDS. And then HSTS would be the dark, the top of each of those bars. And then we also have the yields on the same, the same plot. So the yields got to be. You have to read those on the, on that left on the right scale. Sorry. And again, the non-point sources in the gray and the uh, per capita, the the, the uh, phosphorus pounds per person is, is right. And you read those on the on the right scale. So the big takeaway from the Maumee here is that there's a huge annual variation, we, more than we see everywhere. Um, and, and, that, and that's because it's driven by the um, non-point source. Like we mentioned, when, um, like the other talks have mentioned, when there is more flow, we see more load. That, that's, it's not really that surprising. There's more runoff. There, there's, um, there's more flow from everywhere. There's more, um, we, uh, I think, was mentioned even earlier, 2017 was certainly a wet year. Here's our um, uh, phosphorus pounds per acre in, in 2017. We were over one and a half pounds per acre. It's a huge amount. In a much drier year, much drier year, 2016, um, we didn't even get to, uh, well, we only, we only exceeded 1.3. Uh, 
So big variation, and the big variation, you know, that, that's, that, that non-point source is really what's driving the variation of the total load in the Maumee. And I should say, we, we are seeing that basically in, in all of the watersheds that are, are generally driven by non-point source. Um, this is the five-year average of um, the total phosphorus and the total nitrogen for um, the Maumee uh, in a pie chart. We haven't shown you in a pie chart here. You'll note that the... Um, both the phosphorus and the total nitrogen are, are basically 90% or very close to 90% non-point source in both these watersheds. This pretty much makes sense. There, there's not a ton of people, and when there's not a ton of people, then that means you have, um, uh, you have less of the point sources. Moving on to the Cuyahoga. There are some people in the Cuyahoga. The Cuyahoga drains the Cleveland metro area. This is the same slide we looked at earlier, same um, graph we looked at earlier for the, um, in the Maumee for the last five years. So... Recall that when we looked at all the watersheds together, um, the Cuyahoga has a fair amount of point source, which we expect from such a high area. But actually, its per capita, um, its per person phosphorus is, actually, is the lowest of all the watersheds we looked at. And the reason for that is it, the Cuyahoga, it's not a huge watershed, and it's, it's very densely populated, so the, all those Cleveland metro areas. Um, the denser they are populated, the more people are being serviced by the um, major wastewater treatment plants. And really, the Often, the, once we get to over a million gallons a day, those are the treatment plants that are really driving down the phosphorus uh, concentrations. So basically, there's more phosphorus treatment uh, in the Cuyahoga than, than any of the other watersheds, including, for instance, the Scioto. Uh, and so here's the five-year average of the Scioto, uh, sorry, of the Cuyahoga. Um, not treating for, uh, so the point sources and the um, nitrogen, uh, the point source, the total phosphorus and the nitrogen you see is not an even break like it was in the Maumee. Um, because phosphorus is treated so hard, there's so, and so much of it is of the uh, total phosphorus is from the NPDES side. Now we'll look at the Scioto. That's my home watershed. Um, it, Scioto has a hefty amount of point sources as well. Um, it, it, really the big part of this is, well, two things. We have the Columbus Metro sprawling area that's all included in this, but also because none of these wastewater treatment plants have to treat for phosphorus. They, um, they, they have no limits. So they could be, like we said, we try to, the lake area limits are, are one milligram per liter, and, and a lot of folks are doing well below that. But um, we, we can see two milligrams per liter, three milligrams per liter at some of these um, um, Ohio River drainage treatments systems. Um, and, and we can really see this by, from our study by looking at that per capita. So here we're, um, over, we're close to one pound per person in almost every year. Remember in the Cuyahoga, it, was around point, it, it never reached 0.4 pounds per person. So it makes a big difference when there is phosphorus treatment. Uh, the five-year average of the Scioto. Last watershed that I'll do a little detailed look at is the Muskingum. Now, Muskingum is pretty evenly split between point source and non-point source, but recall that its total phosphorus w was quite a bit re reduced relative to the other watersheds um, th that had a lot more either urban development and or agriculture. Um, compared to the Maumee, where almost every year exceeded one pound per acre, here um, we don't have a single year that reaches half a pound per acre. So looking at those gray bars, they're real, way lower compared to the Maumees, which are up in the one, one and a half zone. Again, it, it is uh, over, it is fifty percent um, not developed natural areas, a lot of forest areas. There's also a lot of reservoirs in the Muskingum watershed. You might be familiar with the Muskingum Conservancy District, and, and then also there's some state parks with large reservoirs. And uh, our method it basically considers all the phosphorus that makes it to all the little tributaries and, and through the, r the river systems. It's going to make it out by the end of that year. So we're being conservative with the phosphorus. We think in general this is a pretty good method because phosphorus doesn't sink too much, but we do know when you have a lot of those reservoirs, it do, they do sink phosphorus. And some of those reservoirs in the Muskingum Conservancy District, they're actually having some problems because there's so much phosphorus building up and in in, in sediment building up in the bottom of those reservoirs. So in the Maumee and the Muskingum, not a ton of development or ag land in comparison to the other watersheds. So that's a quick uh, overview of, of what the, the study has done. I have some more slides here talking about the future work and other things that we've looked at. Um, first off, we, we do want to fill in the gray area, Ohio, um, the state of Ohio. All of our partners are working really hard to try to especially get the Little Miami watershed. That's a big gap there, the Hawking River watershed and the Mahoning. We do have the Huron now, so you'll see the Huron in the next nutrient mass balance study. Um, but we, we also are looking into the sub-watersheds, and um, this is actually in the uh, current nutrient mass balance report. So this is the Maumee River watershed as a whole, and what all the numbers I was just showing you were based at Waterville, the, the near the mouth of the Maumee site. In the, new, in the current uh, report, we actually looked, we have, we have the similar type of monitoring, the, the really good 
well-defined pore point load of nutrients at uh, sites with up in the watershed. And so here we're looking at the Tiffin, near the mouth of the Tiffin, really close to the mouth of the Auglaise, and then the Maumee River as it kind of comes into Ohio from Indiana. Uh, we call that the Upper Maumee. So in the report, we're, we do our best with kind of some limited data to try to say what's, go what's the differences between the Auglaise and the Tiffin. And, uh, and Ohio, Ohio EPA has been looking at these differences within the watersheds. Um, we're trying to get more and more refinement on that. We're, the data is coming in. We actually have a great deal more. So that last map, this is the Maumee again. I showed you Waterville. I showed you the bottom of uh, near the mouth of the Tiffin, the mouth of the Auglaise, and the site um, on the Maumee coming in from Indiana. All of these dots now, we have nutrient monitoring, everyday nutrient monitoring. Um, there's 23 in the Maumee. There's uh, 31 uh, that contribute to the western basin of Lake Erie. Uh, so we do think we're going to do a, a much better job of, of getting refined and up into the watersheds. Some of these um, sites, they drain a really small amount of area. Uh, the, the quick video we showed you, that's USGS's site at Little Flat Rock Creek, which is in Paulding County. It doesn't drain more than 20 square miles. So we'll be using these for a different policy. We're, we're sharing these with AG. Um, the Ohio Lake Erie Commission is, is working on coming out with a report that will ex have all of these data um, including these maps, and you'll see what we've calculated in the recent years. So going back for, for instance, the Waterville, which Waterville has been monitored since the 1970s, but uh, the uh, lower Auglaise, we got about five, ten years of data there, but these other ones, we're only going to have one or two year of data, but we're trying to get all that calculated so we can have some apples to apples comparison like we've done with this nutrient mass balance study. Um, but it's not just Western Lake Erie. Um, this is uh, kind of the... Sandusky River Basin, you see there's additional sites that actually Heidelberg's been monitoring most of those for a long time. The Cuyahoga is already in our report, but we uh, believe we'll be able, and we know um, the Huron River, where are you? There you are, uh, in Milan. Uh, we'll, we'll have that in our next report. There's more gauges coming on board, we're tr so we're trying to have a better understanding so we can understand these watersheds and do these apples-to-apples -apples comparisons like we've been talking about. Um, and as I mentioned in the earlier slide, the, the Ohio River key tributaries, we're trying to get those um, monitored as well. In addition to getting up in the watersheds, we do want to look at refining um, how the non-point source, as I've said a few times today, our report does not differentiate between ag, between urban, and between background. Um, we want to work at that. We, we, we want to work with our partners in research. Um, these edge of field studies, I think we talked a lot about today that there's not clear, certain, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of data on what's going on, on what's coming off of fields, but th th there's still a lot of variability. There's a huge amount of variability. That was kind of one of the themes, I think, of these talks I've been hearing this afternoon. So we don't want to jump into this. Um, we want to make sure we work with all the partners before we kind of differentiate these non-point source loads. As a closing note, um, and uh, maybe you'll have some questions, the nutrient mass balance study, well, you know, we, we do this as a fiat from the state legislation. There was a lot of interested parties that wanted us to do this um, from, from various so sources of nutrients. Um, they, they, you know, they lobbied their um, state legislators for this study to happen. Um, the idea of the study is to be informational, is to say, here's what the data is telling us. We um, vetted our methods with the Ohio Farm Bureau with um, an organization that represents large um, municip municipalities, um, and then with all of our sister state agencies and researchers and of course, especially uh, Laura Johnson at Heidelberg, who are using most of her data. Um, so it, it's not intended to make recommendations. Uh, if you download the report, you'll see we're not saying this needs to be reduced here and this needs to be reduced or we need to do that. that that's not the point of this particular report. And with that, I have some questions. I'll, I'll remind everybody, it's really easy to find this. Don't try to mess with our website because it's so tricky to go around government websites, right? Just Google Ohio EPA Nutrient Mass Balance and... Um, all of this detail and, and a great deal more. So. Yes. Question, uh, to what extent are your methods of calculating this mass balance defined in administrative code? Uh, you said you had the FIAT uh, and yeah. the Ohio revised code. What exists in administrative code that dictates how you begin to break all this out? I, I, that's a great question, and, and Josh would be able to answer a lot better. I don't think it's that detailed. I think it's pretty general. I think we did our best, and, and like I said, I, I, it, was, it was one of the success stories is we actually went and, and, and showed this off to everyone and made sure people were comfortable with our method. But I don't, I don't think much. You may be familiar that um, our TMDL program has new rules that just came out. It, it, it has a little more in it as far as what is required uh, for, measure, for uh, calculations within TMDL. Still not super detailed. Um, but, uh, but for the nutrient mass balance study, we were just trying to follow the best science possible. Sure. Regarding your future work, uh, trying to differentiate some of the things you mentioned, 
do you see this monitoring program uh, backed up to the outlets of some of the smaller streams? Yeah, so the, we've been expanding the monitoring program, as I showed you with that map, with lots of more sites. And, it, and it's tricky because it's, uh, there's a variety of funding sources that um, we've been having to cobble together. So because of that and because there's kind of different reasons we want to use these data, like I mentioned, some of the smaller watershed data, we think that that could be useful to, you know, adding on to the edge of field studies to say how much of BMPs, and this could be urban stormwater BMPs or ag BMPs, how much are they making a difference? Um, some of those were, were put there because of the RCPP program. You might be familiar with what NRCS did. That's the uh, West and the um, little, uh, sorry, West, uh, South Turkey Foot and West Creek. They were, th those gauges were put there originally because RCPP focused some money on there. But as far as getting closer to outlets, uh, at different size streams, you mean? Well, since, yeah, different size streams, but the point would be to try to separate out, you know, smaller ones, large shit another small watershed where those are combined. Right, yeah. Yeah, so, and, that, and that's why we have these different, different phases of, we have a group that's in the Ohio Domestic Action Plan, which outlines um, how Ohio is going to meet the Annex 4 um, lake area reduction goals. We have a group called Sentinel Sites, and all, all these sites are listed in the Ohio Domestic Action Plan. And so those Sentinel Sites are all at, at that same less than 50 square miles. So those, you know, we don't want them to be overlapped. But you're right, when you, when you have the Auglaes, Near, in defiance, that site, that's draining all of the Blanchard, all of the Ottawa, where we're sitting here, I believe we're in the Ottawa watershed, um, and, and um, Paulding County, it's, it's draining so much. And so um, it, what, do you, what can you really say from that? So we do think when you compare similar watersheds at similar scales, then it, when you, the area, um, the, when we do the area yields and the population yields, that, that's pretty helpful. But, but it, it can, the scale can kind of mess us up a little bit. Um, I, 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 I've cut my teeth doing modeling for TMDLs and, and sediment, it makes a big difference. Sediment delivery ratios really change when watershed scales. Sure. In the back. So obviously the distressed watersheds got kind of tabled at this point, but do all those watersheds currently have testing facilities on them? And it's, I mean, I'm not asking you to speculate whether they were added to that list because of that. Right. But are all those, I mean, I think they were, yeah. Um, you, yeah, so that was a, a, a Governor Kasich executive order. You know, it wasn't from Ohio EPA. Um, but I, I do believe, yeah, so the Blanchard was listed. The, um, I think the Upper Auglaes was listed separately. Then the whole Auglaes was listed. Uh, Platter Creek, yeah, so th there, there is monitoring all those. And I, I believe that that monitoring did go into the, the decisions. Um, ODA wrote a report on w why the... Um, why that, uh, those are, these are distressed watersheds that they presented to the Soil and Water Commission last year. Um, and I believe there, there's a, there is discussion about um, the loadings from these, these tributaries. My only smile on the camera came out. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, do you see, like, is there any need for, should we, or will there be on phosphorus loading coming from the ice water? That, that, that's a good question. Um, talk to your legislature. <laughs> um, uh, you know, we just implement the, the law. Uh, so, um, uh, I, I, and with the new administration, I'm not really sure what the, what the directives are, um, where we're going to go with that. Somewhat changing topics. Uh, can you give us some insight on where the agency's efforts stand with regard to developing nutrient water quality standards and upland aquatic life use standards? Okay, as far as the nutrient water quality standards, um, we do have a fair amount of material on our website that explains the efforts we've gone through. The most recently, there was a, a technical advisory group, nutrient technical advisory group, that brought in parties from um, all, all across the state um, to, to look at the options we have. And on our website, if you uh, type in, if you were to Google, again, Ohio EPA um, nutrient reduction, it, it'll pop up our nutrient site. And so there's a whole list there of things we've worked on. Within that list on our website, you'll see the, the SNAP, which is a, an assessment tool that, that is in draft that we've looked at to kind of determine if streams are impaired or not. And it has kind of in-stream nutrient benchmarks. 
So it's important that we all realize that we're talking about kind of the near field earlier, that what's happening in the streams. So that's as far as I can tell you uh, uh, how far that's gone so far, is what we've published so far on the website. My experience has been that Ohio EPA has been attempting to do this for 25 or maybe even 30 years. And, and, and to, to some extent, we still don't have a reference point for what is considered high or low for a nutrient concentration in a stream spot. Right. We... We have a, f a few things, and they're, they're, on, they're on the website there. We, we, we have, um, we've been, over the years, we based our TMDL limits. Again, this is for near field, not for, for so this would be for streams. Um, uh, based on a document that came out in 1999, we call it the associations document. In the very front of that document, there was suggested criteria. And so th 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 that is kind of hard numbers, but again, they're not in rule, so they're not law to us. Um, and in, a, in our nutrient um, tag group, uh, some more updated numbers, they really aren't that hugely different. Um, you can read about them in there. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a struggle um, working on developing criteria. It's, um, it takes a lot of work, and there's a lot of parties involved.